We're going to begin with hymn number two, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let's stand together. We're going to sing all four verses. Hymn number two.
standing for prayer, please? Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us the privilege to come back to your house today. Thank you for the beautiful week you've given us, God. And Lord, we thank you for your love that you gave your only begotten Son for those who believe should not perish but have everlasting life. We know that nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, bless everybody that's in attendance today. We want to ask you for your blessings on the ones in the nursing home and homebound and in the hospitals, God. Especially the one that's in the Baptist, God. Thank you. Blue with the offering, Lord, I pray you're blessed. The giver and the giver may have been used to first spread your word through here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Sometimes it's difficult to understand every word when a choir sings. And this song has such a powerful message, I've asked that we have the words on the screen. So I want you to follow along the words, listen to the choir, and ask the Lord to speak to your heart. This is such a powerful song, and we do it for the Lord.
Yes. Amen. Oh, let's pray together. Father, it is so good to sense your presence in this place today. We thank you for giving us the promise where two or three are gathered in your name that you are there and we know that you're here today. We, we feel your presence. We see a manifestation of your presence through the expressions on the faces of those in the choir and through the voices in which they sang with this morning and Lord, through the words of this song that Lord has so been a, been a blessing to us today and Father, I want to thank you I want to thank you for the choir and for the children and for everything that has been said and done thus far to set the stage and prepare our hearts for the Word of God, which is the most important part of the service. It's a time that we come together when we open your Word. And Lord, I pray that you will help me today to clearly and in a very simple way uh, communicate the truth of your Word to your people. And I pray that this simple message will be a challenge to each and every one of us who are here and to those that may listen to this message. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take complete control of me and of everyone in this place. I pray, Father, that we will listen attentively to your word and that we will listen attentively to your voice and the leadership of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that, Lord, when the invitation time comes, that you would help us to respond in obedience to your word, to your promptings, to whatever you tell us to do. Father, we praise you. We bless you today for who you are and for all that you do for us. And we bless you and praise you most of all for Jesus and for salvation that we have through him. Thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Thank you for his shed blood on the cross for all of us and for the world. Now, Lord, I pray, bless the reading and the proclamation of your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. As I continue trying to prepare myself and prepare you as my church family for our upcoming revival, which begins next Sunday morning at regular worship time right here, Dr. Chris Schofield will be here preaching. Pray for Brother Chris. I spoke with him this past week, and he uh, was having some physical issues. And so please uh, remember him in your prayers and pray that... Uh, the Lord will work it out where he can come and share the word of God with us. Brother Jerry Fugate will be here beginning Sunday evening to uh, conduct our worship time. And so please pray for our revival team as they come uh, to lead us in this revival effort. Now, revival meetings are primarily for the church. Certainly, uh, we see people saved during revival meetings, those meetings that are truly revival meetings, we see people say, but revival meetings are primarily for the church. It is, a, it is a time for members of the body of Christ to experience spiritual renewal by the power of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It, it, it is a time for us to be renewed in our spiritual lives, and this spiritual renewal does not come by any human means. Are you listening to me? Revival does not come by human means. It is not anything that you nor I nor anyone can manufacture. It is only, listen, it is something that only God can bring because revival, true revival, is a supernatural work of God in the hearts and the lives of God's people. And if you and I and those who attend these series of services that we have planned, if we experience revival, it will be because God's Spirit and God's Word has done a work within our hearts and our lives. 
I want you to focus your attention now, if you would please, on one verse of Scripture and verse 6 of Philippians chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul talks about or refers to this work that God does within the hearts and lives of his children. And let's just begin reading in verse 3 to sort of put it in the context. Paul is introducing himself and here in verses 1 and 2 and giving them, extending grace to them in verse 2. But then he says in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Now watch verse 6 being confident of this very thing. In other words, Paul is saying, I am convinced of what I'm about to say to you is true. And he says, being confident or being convinced of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If anyone works within the heart and the life of any believer, it is God. And so today I want us to think about this subject, God's work within. And I want you to understand that we're referring to God's work within our hearts and our spirits, our minds, as we think about God sending us revival. And so today as we look at this particular subject, I want to share five things with you very quickly. They're very simple and yet I believe we find most of them in the text. But I want you to see, first of all, that God's work within is a personal work. Look, if you would, please, in verse 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he. Notice the word he. The word he in this verse refers to none other than to God. Paul is talking about how God is doing a work in them how he began the work in them, how he will finish the work that he began in them. I want you to understand this is God's personal work. He does not send someone else to do it. God himself does this work within our hearts and within the hearts of all believers. God himself begins his work before salvation. Now I want you to listen to me very carefully. Do you understand this morning that before you and I were saved, God began his work in us? Before we, were ever, before we ever came to the knowledge of truth, God was working in us and on us. The Bible tells us, for example, that he begins to draw a lost person. When a lost person is out in the world doing their own thing, it is God's spirit and it is by the spirit of God and the power of God that God begins to draw them. He begins to attract them, if you please, to himself and to Jesus and to the cross. Jesus said in John 6, and 65, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Are you listening? Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 65, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my Father. You nor I nor anyone else would be saved today if it were not for the drawing power of the Holy Spirit of God. And God began that work before we were ever saved. That work began in you and in me and all people who are saved today before we were ever saved and born again. But not only does he draw, he convicts. The Bible says in John 16 and 8, and Jesus spoke these words as he was referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit on this earth. And he says, and when he is come, he, the Spirit, will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. That word reprove in the Greek means to convince. Um, and so he's talking about how and to convict. And so he's talking about how that the Spirit of God begins this, this work before salvation to draw men to himself and to convince men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. You see, God does that by targeting man's heart, man's mind, man's conscience, man's spirit, and man's will. God does that by, by focusing in on the inner being of man, the real you and the real me. And so I want you to notice that uh, he not only begins this work before salvation, but he bestows the Holy Spirit at salvation and continues to do that work in us through the, the Spirit of Almighty God. In Romans, I'm just going to give you some verses. All these verses refer to how the Holy Spirit permanently indwells every single believer. For example, in Romans 8, 9 and 11, 
in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16 and in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit sets up his dwelling place inside the heart and the life of every single Christian. He abides within. He dwells within. And the word dwell and dwelleth is used there in the King James Version. And those words... Uh, mean to occupy. It means to reside. So to reside means that, that one's permanent home is in a particular place. And in the scripture, the spirit makes his permanent home, guess where? In the heart and in the life and the spirit of every single believer, every person who receives Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And so I want you to notice that this is a personal work that God does himself through his spirit on the inside of every single Christian. Secondly, I want you to notice that it is not only a personal work that God does, but God's work within is a pleasant work. For he says here in the verse, listen to what he says, being caught of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you. Now notice if you would please, God's work is a pleasant work because number one, it is God's work. We're talking about God Almighty in heaven doing a work in the lives of those who trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. It, the Bible says that God is good and that he is good to all. So therefore, listen, we, we have to know that it is a pleasant work that God will do in us. But not only is it pleasant because it is God's work, but it is pleasant because this good work, this good work that by, the Bible says here, it, can, it refers to, it, it changes the life of one who believes. It changes the life of one who believes. And it brings about a change for the good. Did you hear me? The work that God does is a work that brings about a change for the good. He gives us eternal life. He gives us a brand new life. A matter of fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And that brings me to the third thing that I want to mention this morning, and that is this. Not only is God's work within a personal work and a pleasant work, but thirdly, it is a powerful work. God's work within all of our lives is a powerful work. You say, well, why is that? Because, work, listen, God's work has a powerful effect on people. I want to give you some, an example. We could use several examples from the Bible, but I want to give you a biblical example. Turn, if you would, please, to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And if you recall, in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says that the church of Jesus Christ was suffering great persecution. In Acts chapter 8, the Bible says in Acts 8 and in, verses, in verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death, referring to Stephen's death, which are in the verses prior to that, in verses 54 through 60 of chapter 7. It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And then the Bible tells us where most of this great persecution was coming from. It was coming from a man by the name of Saul. This is, this is uh, later became Paul. Uh, God named him Paul or he took the name Paul later but he's referring to Saul here in Acts chapter 9 and I want you to begin reading with me in verse 1 Acts chapter 9 verse 1 and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem now Paul was was one that was instigating this part of this great persecution that was coming against the church and he was having papers written up by the authorities to have people, Christian people, put in jail, in prison, and killed. And so the Bible says that he was on his way to Damascus to receive letters from the authorities so that he could have more of these so-called people of the way, our Christian people, persecuted. And the Bible says in verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, suddenly, you see, that's how God works. God works suddenly, sometimes unexpectedly. God intervenes in our lives. But it says here, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, 
I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judah, uh, Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And there he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer of my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul was certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Now watch this, verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which are called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in, at Damascus proving that this is very Christ. Do you see what a drastic change God made in the life of the Apostle Paul? How did he do that? God did a tremendous work in the heart and the mind and the spirit of Paul or Saul at that time. God's spirit dealt with him. God's spirit convicted him. God's spirit is the one that invaded his life and did a work in his heart. And that man that was a great persecutor of the church became a preacher of Christ. Tell me that, there, that God's spirit cannot change a person's life. You're looking at a man that was changed by the, by the power of God and the spirit of God. Many of you have heard my testimony. God radically changed my life. And if you're here today and you've been saved and born again, you too have been changed. You have experienced a change in your life. That change came about because God loved us so much that he was willing to give his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That change came about because God sent his spirit to do a great and mighty and powerful work in our hearts and lives to bring us to the knowledge of the truth so that we would understand what we needed and who we needed in our life. And you and I would not be here today. We would not know what we know. We would not know who we know today if we're not for the Spirit of God working in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. That is the work that God does within people. And so this work that God does within is a personal work. It is a pleasant work. It is a powerful work. But thirdly, fourthly, excuse me, fourthly, it is a purposeful work. God's work is a purposeful work. You see, God works within the believer to achieve a result. Are you listening? God does a work in you and in me and in every person that he goes to to work in. He, he, his purpose is to achieve a result in your life and in my life. And I want to mention three results. Right from the scripture, okay? Number one, his first result that he tries to achieve is to convert someone to convert people, to convert lost people. I use that word convert because that's what salvation is all about. It is about changing someone. And that verse I quoted a few minutes ago that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore if any man, any person be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away and behold, all things become new. That's change. That's converting a person from being one kind of person to converting a person and changing a person to become more like Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God. And so I say to you that his purpose, number one, is to convert. And Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, except you be converted, you be changed. 
and become as little children. Ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. God's desire is that every person be converted. The Bible says he does not want one to perish. No, not one. Jesus said those that will call on him and those that will come unto him, he will in no wise cast them out. Why? Because he does not want to see one perish in their sins. Not only does, is God's purpose to convert, but secondly, his purpose is to conform. You say, what do you mean? I mean, God, his purpose is to conform you and me and all believers to the, uh, so that we will become more like Jesus. Romans eight twenty nine says, listen to this verse. For whom he, God, did foreknow, he, God, also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, listen to this verse. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord is the one that changes us from glory to glory. We're being changed as we walk through this life to be conformed to the very image of His Son. But listen, not only is His purpose to convert and not only is His purpose to conform, but last of all, I want you to say His purpose is for us to comply to the will of God. Listen at this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Just flip on over a page if, if, if it, you have to in your Bible. But in two, uh, Philippians 2 and 13, listen at this verse. He says, uh, for it is God, watch this, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God is working in you and in me so that we will will and to do of his good pleasure, that we will obey him, that we will follow him, that we will obey his word and his will. And so God's work within is a purposeful work. His purpose is to convert, his purpose is to conform, and his purpose is for us to comply with the word and the will of Almighty God. Finally, this morning, I want you to understand that not only is God's work a personal work, not only is it a pleasant work, not only is it a powerful work, and not only is it a purposeful work, but finally, His work is a permanent work. Look at what He says in verse 6. Being called to this very thing, that He, God, which hath begun a good work in you, when did He begin it? Before salvation. Before salvation, He began that work. He says, the one that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what that is saying? That is saying that His work is a, is a permanent work. When God began that work in you and in me before we were ever saved, He's continuing to work on us since we are saved. He will continue to work on us until Jesus comes or He calls us home, whichever comes first. It is a permanent work. God will continue to work until the day of the Lord. And God will carry it forward to completion. Now mind you that there are many Christians today who will not allow God to work in them the way He wants to work. At least God does His work, but they won't submit to His leadership and to the work that He wants to do and desires to do and is doing in their life. And that's what revival is all about. It is about listening to the Word of God and the Spirit of God and being obedient to both. It is about praying and asking God and seeking God to do a work in us, a work that only He can do. You and I can only do certain things. We Listen, it is, it is by the power of God and the Spirit of God and the Word of God that we are changed. And I don't know about you, but I want to be different. I want to be like Jesus. I want to walk in His will every day. I want to obey His Word every day. I want to have such a close relationship with the Lord. But the truth is, my dear friend, brethren, listen to me. The truth is we don't, always, we don't always have that kind of relationship. And that's what revival is all about. That's what church is about on Sunday morning. It is about God's people coming together and listening to the word that God has given his servant to share with the congregation and heeding that word. But how many times do we come and we hear, but we never heed? We leave out the doors of this sanctuary on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and we, and we say, oh, that was a good sermon, or maybe we didn't think it was such a good sermon, and we didn't even listen to what was said. It went in one ear and out the other, and it never lodged in our heart and in our mind. 
I hope that you will prepare your heart as I'm trying to prepare my heart to receive whatever God has for us during this revival meeting. I believe that we have God's man coming to share the word of God and I know he will share the word of God. And the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the word of God that can pierce the deepest recesses of our soul. And it is the spirit of God who can take that word and drive it home, the truth of that word to our minds and our hearts and our spirits. And it is the spirit of God who can move in us and change our lives. So I want to challenge you. Number one, be in attendance. Number two, pray, pray, pray. Pray for yourself and pray for the church as a whole and pray for our team as they come. Now you may be here today and you're not saved. You've never been born again. You've never trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I, during this invitation this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to come and trust Christ. I want to tell you, if, if you're sensing in your heart and in your spirit uh, God drawing you to himself and you say, well, what does that feel like? Uh, I, I don't, I know how I felt. I know what I experienced many, many years ago, but I don't know that you will have the same experience. All I know is, is that you will be aware of the fact that God is dealing in your heart and that he's speaking to you. You will be made aware of the fact that you are lost and that you need Jesus Christ. And when you come to that knowledge and that understanding that yes, you are a sinner and your sin separates you from God, yet, but God loved you so much he was willing to send his only begotten son Jesus to this world to die for you on the cross and pay your sin debt in full. He was buried, he rose again the third day. If you will believe that, the Bible says that if I shall believe with thy, uh, shall confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved, but you must believe with all of your heart and you must submit your entire life and your soul and entrust your soul and your spirit and your body and your whole life to Jesus Christ and commit yourself to him and when you do that and you turn from your sin the moment you're, you repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone for your eternal salvation it is at that moment that you will be birthed into the family and the kingdom of God Amen. and God will save you he will change your life and he will give you a home in heaven when you die. But you need to trust him as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you're here this morning, you're a Christian, and you know you're not where you should be. You, you know this morning you are not where you once were in your relationship with God. You need to do something about that. Why sit there on the pew or stand behind the pew this morning when you know there are some things in your life that should not be there? Why don't you humble yourself before men and humble yourself before God and let God have his way in your life for a change instead of you having your way. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless you today for who you are and for all that you've done for us. We thank you for that work within, your work within our hearts and lives. We would not be where we are or who we are if it were not for your work within us. And Father, I thank you for this little verse of Scripture and I thank you for the whole Word of God from which we can glean great truth, truth that we can apply to our hearts and our lives, truth that we can take to the bank, so to speak, truth that we can, we can rest upon all the days of our life. Oh, Father, how I pray today that you will move in our hearts and our lives and that we will move and we will respond in obedience to what you tell us to do today. And we thank you and we praise you, Father. Save the lost and encourage and bless the saved, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. And would you come? I'll be here to greet you and help you any way that I can.